Uh, yeah. Hi, folks. My name is Dan Kahn. I'm the executive director of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is putting on this conference uh, this week. And really appreciate all of you attending. And I'm thrilled to get to talk for a little bit about uh, one of my favorite topics, which is uh, CNFs, or Cloud Native Network Functions. Uh, this is a little bit of a directional talk, uh, more than a, oh, you absolutely need to go adopt this today kind of thing. Uh, but I would say that if you look at CNCF, which is the, the organization that hosts Kubernetes and KubeCon and these other projects, uh, this is going to be one of our major focuses in 2019 of uh, telling a story about how Kubernetes makes sense in the telecoms world. So uh, hopefully you've heard this already, but uh, CNCF is part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, we just celebrated our three-year birthday uh, this week. We had a nice little birthday cake uh, that was on Twitter. And um, we have three projects that have graduated uh, that we talked about in the keynotes the last couple days, and then uh, 17 that are incubating uh, etcd just got contributed, uh, which we were thrilled with. And we have 19 Platinum members here uh, representing most of the public cloud and uh, a lot of private cloud offerings as well. Um, we talk about this slide of that um, CNCF is focused on trying to help these technologies mature and also from a signaling standpoint to tell enterprises which ones they should be adopting. That uh, 2018 was the year that Kubernetes crossed the chasm into the early majority. We would definitely say that it has not been uh, reached the late majority or laggards yet. Um, but some of the areas I'm talking about here of trying to apply Kubernetes to a new uh, venue to telcos is, uh, is different and uh, much less mature. And I think most folks are familiar that uh, CNCF is part of the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation today is far more than just Linux. So uh, Let's Encrypt gives out more than half of the world's security certificates. LF Networking has several projects, including ONAP and OPNFV, uh, FIDO, and others that um, are taking the lead in, in uh, VNFs and uh, software-defined networking. CNCF in the cloud. Automotive-grade Linux is shipping in all new Toyotas, several other manufacturers. Hyperledger is one of the leading op options in blockchain. And Node.js is uh, one of the most popular application frameworks on the web. Uh, you know about the top one because you're here. But um, I do want to point out that we are doing three events next year that we're uh, extremely excited about. And so we're going to be in Barcelona a, a mere six months from now, back in Shanghai because we're making a huge investment in China at the end of June, and then a year from now in San Diego. And I think folks saw this slide uh, from some keynotes, but it is uh, crazy to talk about the growth of KubeCon as a signal for the growth in our community that we were here in Seattle two years ago with 1,000 attendees. Um, anyone raise your hand if you were here in Seattle two years ago? Yeah, okay, so we have one person here. So that's sort of representative. And now we're at, uh, at 8x, uh, that, which is a little crazy. OK, so this is my extremely bre abbreviated story of all of networking technology history. Um, I used to live and work here in Seattle for the telecoms mogul Craig McCaw and uh, his satellite venture Teledesic and his CLEC, which was called NextLink and then XO Communications. And so at the time, we would spend huge quantities of money with Cisco to buy these very, uh, and Cisco would loan us all of that money ahead of time, which was even better, uh, but to buy these big physical boxes. Uh, and each box did something different. So uh, the router, the switches, the firewall, and uh, it kind of looked like this, but lots of racks of it. But uh, Cat 6, might have even been Cat 5 at the time, cabling, connecting it all together. And uh, over the last decade, there's been this major trend in telecoms of saying that each of those boxes were moved from being separate physical components to being virtual machines that are called virtual network functions. And those generally run on top of VMware or OpenStack. And um, ideally, it looks like this, that you have a very clean data center. All of the servers can be identical. And you can um, move the workloads around a little bit uh, based on demand. What we're talking about today is what we think is going to be the next big trend in how uh, telcos uh, use software, which is that they can take that networking code and instead of having it packaged in virtual machines on OpenStack, 
can uh, package it as containers, run it on Kubernetes, um, and can then deploy it, as we've been talking about at the whole conference, on public, private, or hybrid clouds. And it will look like this, which is exactly the other picture, except the software uh, on it is different. So um, this is sort of, um, I think, I sort of feel like an enterprise computing and software development. The pull request is the coin of the realm, and then networking. People really like block diagrams. So, um, yes. <laughs> so uh, this is a block diagram to talk about that evolution. Um, it's uh, something we put together in partnership with another Linux Foundation project, ONAP, um, which came out of AT&T and China Mobile and has uh, gotten a lot of adoption. But um, Amsterdam, the original version of that, ran on OpenStack or VMware on bare metal and on Azure or Rackspace in the public cloud. And more, a more recent version of it, uh, Casablanca, that just shipped, uh, now can run on top of Kubernetes, and so you can use that on any public cloud or on bare metal, uh, but then your virtual network functions still run on top of OpenStack on bare metal. Uh, and, and now you can, at least in principle, support cloud-native network functions, CNFs, running on top of Kubernetes. The story that we're talking about is the evolution that's possible and that we think is going to occur is that the vast majority of that networking code can evolve to become CNFs, uh, to become containers that are managed just like any other Kubernetes workload. That Kubernetes becomes that universal substrate sitting on top of bare metal or any public cloud, exactly the way it represents that for enterprise computing today. And uh, we'll just give a quick shout out to uh, Project Kubevert. Um, being led particularly by Red Hat right now, but I, I think it uh, has a lot of potential for certain workloads that are not easy to containerize um, or that are more challenging, that it allows you to run certain VMs on top of Kubernetes. Uh, but the idea is that, that uh, all of those pieces can move to be, uh, to be on Kubernetes. Okay, so why care? Uh, the main reasons are that uh, there are, should be significant cost savings. So uh, in principle, containers and Kubernetes is way better at bin packing many different workloads onto the same set of resources. In particular, the, the vision that we have for this is that telcos can be running not just all of their networking software, but their business support systems and their operating support systems all on the same workload, uh, on the same servers and that uh, because they often use different resources, they'll fit together extremely well. And then they can decide whether running on the private cloud or the public cloud or moving back and forth uh, is more uh, cost effective. But that's actually the smallest reason. But by far the biggest reason is number two, which is development velocity. And that's exactly the same story for enterprise computing, where all of these companies uh, that have found that by moving from a monolith and moving to microservices that they're able to move faster. And um, uh, the speaker this morning from Airbnb was a great example of that. And then the third one is resiliency. So um, this actually should be much more reliable than, uh, than things have been in the past. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Uh, it's still hard and there's a lot of work that needs to occur. And I do want to point out um, particularly one of the reasons that it's hard is that the reputation of virtual network functions of VNF is that they are the most um, hackish, poorly thought out with sort of obsolete versions of Linux and all sorts of other upsetting, scary stuff inside of it. Um, and that's not that surprising because the sort of reputation for hardware is that you get something working and then you ship it. And so if they took that and they just moved into a virtual machine, then it may not be very attractive what's in there. But um, the container workload in terms of the Linux API, uh, excuse me, ABI that it has access to and the Kubernetes API, there's just uh, much more stringent requirements about it. And so in fact, moving from physical to virtual P to V um, is quite likely simpler than moving P to C or uh, virtual to containerized. Um, now the good news are, is that it is totally feasible to get the performance you need just using the permissible interfaces of uh, Linux and, and of Kubernetes, but it's meaningful work to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that needs to occur, and it needs to occur essentially separately for each uh, VNF that's out there. So um, I'm gonna hand this off to um, my colleague Taylor in just a second. But um, I do have some pretty useful links in here, and this whole 
uh, presentation will be going up, uh, will be linked from Sketch to take a look at it. So uh, there's a, still a lot of architectural approaches that um, are being debated. Uh, Multis is a technology out of Intel and this idea of having multi-interface pods. Uh, there's also a separate approach called network service mesh of talking about uh, different ways of uh, essentially going around the Kubernetes networking and get high, uh, getting higher performance. Another area, and I do want to address this one in particular, is that there's been, um, I guess, a suggestion that you need some kind of virtual machines in order to get uh, adequate uh, separation. And so the two concerns that have come up, and I'd say they specifically came out of the, the Kata containers community, is, oh, you need to use something like Kata in order, in order to avoid the noisy neighbor problem and uh, for security. And I would really push back aggressively on both of those things. If you just look at Kubernetes in production with thousands of enterprises today, it provides adequate protection from the noisy neighbor problem for memory, for CPU, for uh, network, uh, that the, the whole way that containers work in the Linux operating system is effective. And on security, when you look at the telco use case, the key question is, can the code be trusted or not? Was it written by that telco itself, or did they pay a vendor a lot of money for that uh, virtual network function, and they have a contractual relationship? If it is, then they don't need to worry about having strong barriers between the different containers running on the same system. Now, the exception would be um, if you are running untrusted code. And the classic example here is any sort of web hosting or something like AWS Lambda. And um, out of that work, I think uh, Firecracker that was just announced by Amazon Web Services at reInvent two weeks ago, and Gvisor, which has come out of Google, are both really intriguing technologies and I think can definitely have a, an interesting space in the cloud native ecosystem. But um, I'm quite skeptical about uh, their value in this use case. So um, the heads up that I want to give, and then I'm going to hand it off to uh, Taylor, is that CNCF is actively working on a project that we're, uh, we, don't, we need to come up with a slightly better name for it, but something like the CNF testbed. And the idea is to take the identical networking code, um, in a, we're using code from ONAP because it's open source and a sister project, package it uh, in a virtual machine, run it on OpenStack, um, and to take that same code, package as a container, run it on top of Kubernetes, both running on top of the same bare metal hardware. Just before I hand it off, I really do want to talk about the discipline from a continuous integration standpoint of building up an entire system, running the performance test, and then tearing it down again. Because it seems like the absolute standard thing in the Kubernetes world and in most of the application development and software development world that I'm used to, and yet seems uh, radically just not used in the networking world, where what we keep seeing is that companies set up their own uh, test bed, their own test lab, and then they say, oh, if you have some new code to run, you can send it to us and we'll run it in our lab. But when we go back and say, okay, well, exactly what configuration, exactly what environment do you have in that lab, because we're trying to replicate it, it's often not even available in source control or in a way that we can exactly replicate or uh, referencing all these packages and systems that have gone out of date. And it's caused us a huge amount of hassle and delay and cost and such in creating this. So our aspiration is to create an open source test bed that anyone can replicate. And I want to call out the bare metal hosting company, Packet, who has been a fantastic partner for us uh, with this, where they have these bare metal servers in principle, at least, we want it to be so all you need is an API key, and you can hit run and uh, deploy both of these environments, and then either run our network code that we have as a default, but ideally get to a spot where you could run your own networking uh, code in a VNF or a CNF and see the difference in performance between them. So um, we're actively underway here. This is out of date. We were actually hoping to do a demo. I think uh, Taylor's going to give a little uh, taste of it, but um, Mobile World Congress is where we're planning to uh, roll out this as an open source project that anyone can participate in. And I really want to emphasize our desire to have an apples to apples fair comparison between these different approaches that, uh, so, so if we're not using optimizations that we'd like others to, uh, to make it available. And um, I'm going to stop there. So, uh, Taylor, could you, uh, could you use the rest of the time, please? And then if we have a few minutes left, I might answer some questions at the end. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
very much. Thank you, Dan. Hi, I'm Taylor Carpenter, and I'm going to switch decks here. Let's do this. Okay. So we've had a little bit of an overview of what the project is for. Um, we've had quite a few contributors on this is the CNCF CN, uh, Cloud Native Network Function Project. And we've had a lot of people already contributing from different groups, including some folks from Network Service Mesh, Kubernetes, um, from Linux Foundation FDO project, CSIT, VPP, um, different vendors like Intel, Intel, Cisco. So we went a little over the cost savings and other things. I'm going to just move through here. Again, the ideal outcome running a few CLI commands with the API key, and you could recreate the entire test bed and the results. So how do we get there? Creating a neutral test environment. So thinking about all the hardware infrastructure, the software, the community. So we mentioned Packet, also FDIO CSIT lab. So that's a Linux um, foundation lab. And we want to try to compare the code, how it works and runs in different areas. We're also looking at commodity hardware. So in the NFE world, you are going to have hardware that may be very specialized. To make the entry for other people to rebuild this and test, we think it's important to start with commodity hardware. And then you can build from there. And then the software. Everything that we're doing, 100% open source, trying to do standard practices, um, best practices as well. So we're testing different platforms for Kubernetes, Helm, OpenStack, also vanilla versions. You may have very specialized versions of OpenStack. You may have people that are using KVM with the network functions. We're starting with the vanilla versions that anyone could download and have access to. Um, for the data plane networking, we use VPP, also an FTIO project. <clears throat> and then Dan mentioned apples to apples test. So trying to get as close as possible. The different platforms aren't going to allow it to be exactly apples to apples, so we make sure and note the differences. And then we're trying to look at optimized test cases. So we say, here is how you would do it for KVM. Here's how you do it for Kubernetes or OpenStack. And then a community. So we talked a little bit about the contributors. Here's some of the different groups that have been involved. Um, multiple vendors, so Packet's been directly involved. We've also had Intel, uh, since we're caring about network cards and having their involvement, there's been engineers on that side. Mellanox, that's a network card that's available on a Packet that we've been testing, working towards um, very visible decision-making progress um, process uh, inspired by the CNCF charter. So once we have that neutral test environment, we can start building up the infrastructure on that and the platforms like OpenStack and Kubernetes, how are those going to be there so that anyone could reproduce it and then the test cases themselves. So at Packet, here's an example machine. Um, it's based on Dell hardware. It comes with those Mellanox cards by default. We also tested with some Intel cards that are available at the CSET. Uh, the Linux Foundation Lab, and we can provision all of that with Terraform, and that allows us to give something that anybody in the community may already be familiar with. You can use it on other platforms. And now we get to some scarier stuff with maybe Kubernetes, the layer two configuration, um, dealing with all of the things that Kubernetes makes easier for the app side, but we have to care about for network functions. So looking at how is this going to work? What's the capabilities with the switches and everything there? So trying to find that out. At Packet, they provide an API. So trying to look at that and make it configurable. Um, and then the host networking itself. So this is some things in addition to what you'd have in Kubernetes. 
and the apples to apples, what can we use? So what's the software going to do? Be running on those worker machines or on the compute nodes for OpenStack. So for OpenStack, we are using OpenStack Chef Cookbook for deployments. Um, this is something maintained by the community. So for using open source versions, people are going to know what we're, what we're doing there. Everything's on bare metal again, all the services. And then we're using VPP for both the host networking, the vSwitch. This is what's connecting to the network functions and the network functions to the actual hardware, so the, uh, the, the NICs themselves. And then the high-speed VNFs are running VPP. You could have other things, DHCP server, DNS, and other things that wouldn't be as high performance and directly connected, but the high performance ones are VPP. For KVM environments, very similar. We're using Ansible once the machines are provisioned with Terraform to set up all of the code, and they're also running on bare metal. Again, VPP. For Kubernetes, this is using a mixture of Terraform to provision the machines and then Cloud in it to set up uh, vanilla Kubernetes. And then Ansible again is used to set up some things that are outside, including the layer two networking, because we provide, we provide additional interfaces. You get, by default, your layer three interface on a Kubernetes container. So we add additional interfaces uh, with Ansible. This is prior to network service mesh being fully available, which we are working with as a kind of a goal. Once we have those, then we can look at from what's called in the network, um, the NFE world service topology. So how are these different network functions laid out on the nodes? And then the density on the machines themselves. So there can be different types. So. Before we get into that, here's your just high-level view, whether it's KVM, OpenStack, you have your VNFs running on the machine. We're going to have some type of vSwitch. So you may be familiar on the OpenStack world with OVS or Linux Bridge. We replace that for the high speed with VPP. The, the way it works is very similar, though. Kubernetes, we also plug in vSwitch. That sits side by side with the Linux networking, so you can still use that for your layer three, and then when you need this high performance, you can use this. For the test comparison that we're looking at here, we're picking one network function. As Dan said, you're going to have to look at migrating each one. How do they work? What are their functionality? A VM may have multiple services, and you may want to break that down into smaller microservices as you move to the CNF versions. So we're looking at IPv4 router. It's going to have multiple interfaces. It takes the traffic in, decides on the next de destination, and forwards those packets. Once you have a network function, then you can create what's called a service function chain. So these are a, a set of services that are linked together to provide some larger functionality. You could have firewalls and other things that providing these. For ours, we're looking at the router. Then you can talk about density. So how many of these chains and the network functions are you having? This is showing three chains with one network function. We also tested for what I'm showing you here, three chains with two network functions. So that's six total uh, containers or VMs. And then likewise, two chains and three network functions. This matters not only for how much you utilize the, the cores and stuff on the machine, it's also if you're familiar with hops on a network connecting systems, the similar in, in app servers if you had, say, proxies. Knowing that can affect the performance. So very, very important even on a single physical node. So the apples to apples. We're looking at a snake topology with multiple chains. So what does this mean? It's going to be the same thing for KVM, for OpenStack, for Kubernetes. The traffic goes from the vSwitch and then loops through each of the network functions for the whole chain, whatever the length, until it's ready to leave the node. That's the same thing if you have multiple chains. 
So if we look at a test, it's something like this. You have a traffic generator. It sends the traffic. It's going to go through the switch into the machine all the way through all the chains, and then it loops back around, and we collect the results. So here's some results in a side-by-side -side comparison. This is actually KVM and Kubernetes. So on the right with the CNS, it's, we have Kubernetes, and on the left we have um, KVM for the VNS. And this is in millions of packets per second. So we saw in the two-chain three network function, that's three deep, where it had to loop through, about half a million packets per second for the VNS. And then we saw nearly 8x for the increase for the CNS. So this is looping through. And again, this is the same vSwitch. It's running VPP for both of those. And if we go over to what some people may be more familiar with on network functions is not as deep if you're looking at VMs. So three chains with one network function. We saw 4.5 million. We still saw nearly a 2x increase at 8.9 million for the CNFs. So it's whether you're doing, looking at depth or not, we're seeing an increase in CNFs. Let's look at another case. So this one is talking about the connections between the network functions. We just looked at the snake case where they all loop together. So what, what are the optimal ones for VNS versus CNS? For KVM and OpenStack, that's the snake topology. For Kubernetes or containers, so on Docker, you can do something called a pipeline. And this is where you can directly connect the network functions to each other. And the traffic will go from the vSwitch into the first network function and then directly to the network function for whatever length before it leaves. Same thing for multiple chains. And it looks a little like this. So it's very similar. So here's another comparison side by side. We looked at the VNFs, that's KVM on the left, and then we have Kubernetes on the right. So half a million packets per second for the three depth. And then we had, I think that's around 17x, a little bit more than 17x for the CNFs. So pretty incredible increase for depth. Even if we look at the, the less depth, we can see across the board, and we have some other tests that extensively go on you will see the pipeline, it doesn't matter how many you add, it's still very high. So what this means is if you had microservices and you wanted to share resources on a machine, you could keep adding those and spread them out. This helps with the failure, with resiliency, and other things like that as well. So this is just a summary of the results. Best case um, for the VNF, you're still seeing whether you're using snake case or pipeline a major improvement with CNS. So if you want to verify the results, um, we have everything up on the GitHub, 100% open source. And Dan was saying we would like to, for other people to be able to reproduce, you can reproduce right now the KVM, the uh, KVM, Docker, and Kubernetes right now. OpenStack is very close. That's a little bit hairier, as he's talking about, to be able to do it. But we've really been pushing hard on that, and we're very close. We're on the last part for the VPP with Neutron, trying to use stuff that people are going to understand. Get a packet account. If you have an API key, you can download, follow the steps. If you have any problems, please open an issue, because we're trying to make sure that someone could just walk through and recreate these. Um, so several things here. Keep, we're going to keep add, uh, working with folks. We're working towards uh, adding network service mesh support and working with them directly. So we have that kind of pluggable. Right now, we're, we're manually creating it with Ansible, all that layer two configuration. Well, network service mesh would hopefully be able to plug in at some point right there. Um, we would love more test cases. So if you know of a way to make VNFs look great, We'd like to know what that is. Tell us the details so that we can create those contrasts, the results, and see what it means. Maybe it's because it's very difficult. We'd love to know that. And supporting other environments. Looking at Amazon Bare Metal, we've got to figure out which ones would support these type of test cases. But we'll be looking at that. I think some of the events were mentioned, um, including here we are. 
And here's how you can connect. Besides GitHub, there is a CNF channel on the cloud native Slack. And that's it. I had a Q&A, but you want me to do that or you want to sit back up, Dan? Are we out of time? Uh, yeah, uh, please in the back. You got to repeat that. No, you, you can just repeat it, Taylor. It was frame size was the question? Taylor, just repeat it in the microphone. And, yeah. Okay, um, the question was frame size, so 64 bytes, the packet size, yeah. So, okay. And repeat the question. So was, the question was, were the tests on the same machine, the same compute node, or is it going between nodes? So this test was on a single compute node, so all of the containers on one. We, do, we, do, we will be testing intranode or uh, between nodes. Please. Where is that? You know, uh, right here, Taylor. Oh. Sure. Well, thank you guys for working on this and have been trying to solve it uh, myself. I'm actually from a telco provider. Um, we have been actually working with Intel, uh, developing an open source, kind of like 4G, 5G network core. Uh, we have kind of like a COPS architecture where control and user plane are separated. So one of the challenges we have is essentially to move to Kubernetes, we need layer three, right? Um, specifically, we need multiple interfaces to separate the SGI and S1U interfaces. Uh, one of the issues I have with VPP is that it uses dedicated cores uh, and DPDK, so it does not export, for instance, the SRV uh, pole mode drivers. So I'm just trying to understand, you know, for like uh, flow, a simple flow rule sets, how is that better than OVS DPDK? Um, and also, what's kind of like your vision in essentially uh, creating L3, uh, uh, specifically multiple network interfaces, and just fix the PDK. Uh, problem right now, what, what we are having is you have to have a specific OVS uh, version, you have to have a specific DPDK bits, and it's just like a nightmare. Uh, the other question I, uh, I have. <laughs> I think we're uh, going to limit you to two. <laughs> Taylor, can you? Sorry, uh, the, the other question I have, I mean, the numbers look really good, but like in an average packet gateway, which is the worst case scenario, um, the packet size that we are seeing is actually around 600 plus bytes, yeah. and the numbers will definitely change. So. Yeah, but yeah. before Taylor does try to answer that, I do just want to say we're really eager to get your engagement. So we are yeah. looking to start. Uh, two calls a month, and we'd love to just have a community yeah. of folks discussing it. Because I don't, yeah. but go ahead and try, Taylor. I don't think we're going to get a okay. com comprehensive answer to that. Yeah, we we have no worries. We have several people here. So my checks um, lead on the um, FDO CSIP project, and we have Ed Warnicky for Network Service Mesh. I may bring them in. So we've we've definitely done a lot of tests with different packet sizes, including IMEX. Um, all of the results that we've tested um, in this particular project are pushed up to GitHub. The CSIT um, project and VPP also push tons of results, so that'd be helpful. Get involved on, uh, as, as like Dan is saying. Um, the, I would say part of this is something that Dan spoke to. It's all the new for telcos. So DPDK and all of these projects are trying to move towards how do we solve this. Um, we've handled a lot of how to configure the machines, partly in Ansible, part of it's outside. Network Service Mesh is trying to handle Layer 2 as a service within Kubernetes. You still have the infrastructure side that's outside of that. In fact, we want to talk more about that because we're trying to make that part easy too. Um, I don't have a specific answer for you, um, but we're trying to solve those different problems. I don't, did you hear something? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So if I could quickly comment on the poll mode comment, and I can let maybe yet comment about the, um, the multiple interfaces into, into Kubernetes that NSM is working on. So um, PVP today uh, supports poll mode, as you have rightly said, uh, using DPDK. 
IBBB also supports a number of native drivers, but we prefer to use the PDK because it gives us hardware abstraction. It also supports interrupt mode, and it also now supports something in between. It's called adaptive. Depending on the load, it switches between the two. Uh, in addition to TPTK, uh, we also support, VBP also supports the uh, adaptive VF driver, which is in kernel, in distribution, and uh, whatever works with IVF in kernel works with VBP. Can we just maybe try and get uh, one or two more questions yeah. in and then we'll... So um, I've got one for you and one for you too, and it'll be quick though. Um, to you, what are you doing around standards for CNFs? Because if I see one more block diagram from Etsy, yeah. I'm going to jump off a building. <laughs> <laughs> and so you look, you mentioned the packet core. I work with packet core and I work with virtual CMTS and every mm -hmm. vendor is doing it drastically different. Yeah. And then for you two, when are you going to do real world use cases? I know direct memory copies are fast and I know that VPP can process packets, but there's no complex work being done on those packets. There's no encryption and decryption. There's no in cap yeah. or decap. When do I get those numbers? Uh, I'll do both, which is just, uh, no, I, I have my own thanks. Uh, so CNCF, I think, is probably the most important, most valuable thing we've done in the last three years is our certified Kubernetes program. That's actually only on the platform side. We haven't certified applications. We're at least discussing, particularly with our sister organization, ELF Networking, that we could certify CNFs. And so it, it's, it's very early days. I, I'm, we're not ready to make a commitment on it, but I, I think there would be a ton of value to, to having a belief that a CNF is using a known set of network interfaces, known Kubernetes and, and Linux API and ABI, and uh, would work on platforms from multiple different vendors. And then on the use cases, we just wanted to start with the simplest thing possible, but I will say that ONAP in particular has a bunch of VNFs included in it, and we would love to create some real world change, as you said, around encryption, decryption, DNS, and other kinds of things, and be able, but again, from a straight apples to apples standpoint of saying, what, how does the performance vary? One second. So, we're, so the, on the, we worked a lot on the ONAP CP use case, and one of the things the that we're VCP, finding, yeah, yeah, VCP use case, and trying to move that to work with cloud native functions, and it seems difficult to say that one part. How does one part work unless you make it composable and build up? And that's why we're trying to do that. We would like more complex use cases, especially if you can define one. So if y'all have something that you could say, here is something that's real world, and we'd like to see the performance if we move. If you can define it, then we can build it, and that's what we've been trying to do. Let's get Heather Majek, if you don't mind, and then I, th I think we've actually got to sure. get out of the room. And this is also a little bit of a follow-up to that, that question, and it's more of helping to answer that question as well. So, um, you know, with between the FIDO CSIT team, there's also some benchmarking and performance work that's going on in OPNFE. Um, I think specifically NFE Bench and CSIT have been interacting. There's also VS Perf, and one of the things that we've building up around that are using traffic generators like Ixia to drive more real-world style traffic through things. So there's, so there's some more layers of benchmarking that we've been building up in the VNF world that needs to transition. You know, I know that you worked with some of the the VNF bench people for that, or NFE bench, sorry. So I think that as we kind of tar start taking pieces from all of these projects that I've been working on, kind of the virtualization 1.0, you know, sort of with this project, we can kind of start getting that library of more real world type things. We've got things like a sample VNF project that tries to mimic the sort of performance projects or sort of performance capabilities of real world use cases as, as well. So I think there's a, there's a lot of cross pollination that's started, but not enough, I mean, basically not enough, and there's a lot more opportunity there, kind of amongst the several projects. So I, I think we have to stop there, because there's people coming after us. We'll be outside to chat, and I just want to shout out both Mobile World Congress, but also the Open Networking Summit in San Jose in uh, April. We're going to um, have a whole track on these topics, and would love to engage with folks more there. So actually